know, it's been a, a bit uh, tricky at moments, to say the least, maybe, for sure, this week. Um, but, you know, I'm really appreciative, and that's one reason I'm particularly appreciative of Janos Pastor for coming over to talk to the group tonight, because I think, you know, the, the UN is highly appreciative of the support it's been receiving from civil society. I think the Secretary General really recognizes the importance of civil society and, and the support that is, has been coming through up until this point and uh, support that uh, the UN process is obviously going to need from civil society going forward from this point um, here in Copenhagen. Um, so Janos Pastor is with us here tonight. He is the director of the Secretary General's Climate Change Support Team. Um, he's been instrumental in developing um, the Secretary General team's you know, policies and efforts and messaging um, trying to get here to Copenhagen. Um, he has done a lot of press leading up to uh, uh, the you know, COP15 here in Copenhagen and, and even before the Climate Change Summit in September, including doing a couple of tick, tick, tick briefings in New York um, leading up to the Climate Change Summit in, in September. So. I welcome Janos up to the stage. Um, he's going to speak for a few minutes. Um, again, as you can probably understand, he's got not a lot of time, but he's promised to spend, spend uh, a half hour or so here with us. Um, he's got to get back. Uh, as we were riding over together in the van, he took several calls from you know, the Secretary General's staffs, you know, trying to keep him connected to what's going on over at the Bella Center. So um, I won't say any more because Janos is up on stage and take it away. But following his, his remarks, uh, we'll have time for a few questions, and that's what I wanted to make sure people were aware of. So thanks, Janos. Uh, thanks. Thank, thank you, and uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, it's a it's pleasure to be here. I feel at home. I see only Max, so that's really great, <laughs> unlike uh, in my office. But that's anyway, that's, uh, that's great. And uh, as, as you can imagine, this is the last day, and uh, a lot is happening in the center. And I thought I'll, I'll say a few words. Uh, I will start by. Uh, um, are we okay on that one? Yeah, okay. I will start by uh, just quoting a few words that the Secretary General said uh, this evening, just a little while ago, and uh, I think it's important. I just read them up as they are, and then I'll come back to each one of them separately. But uh, and I start the quote here. Uh, as you know, for the last three days, he has been working with world leaders on the negotiations, and he said, "We are walking a tightrope," but. Uh, he has seen nothing to indicate that we cannot bridge the substantive differences. We can still s seal a deal. All the major actors are here. All the necessary financing elements are on the table. All the major players have made important mitigation commitments. Now leaders need to agree on how to codify them. We have 24 hours to go. He calls on leaders to show common sense, compromise and courage. End of quote. Now, what does this all mean uh, 24 hours before uh, uh, we finish the conference? First of all, um, we have a, this is sort of a very interesting time in the normal negotiation process where we have ups and downs and then we get close to the end and there are all kinds of meetings taking place. What is different here is that the normal negotiation dynamic has to give way now to a new dynamic that we've never seen before. We have 130 leaders. They're not all there yet, but they're, they're all congregating. There will be 130 by tomorrow. And uh, the, the normal negotiation dynamics has to give way to the leaders' dynamic, which we have never seen. This is an unprecedented situation. There has never been a climate change conference that this had, had uh, this kind of level of engagement of heads of states. In fact, I don't know of any other process at the international level that has ever had uh, this kind of preparation of heads of states and government as, as this, uh, uh, this conference. So we are on uncharted territory. There are, it's extraordinary. Uh, there is no precedence to this, and there is no roadmap. We're defining it as we're doing it moment by moment. So let's see how this will work. Uh, the second is that there is really nothing to indicate that we cannot bridge the differences. We have a number of areas where progress has been made on the issue of mitigation, on the issue of finance, on the issue of the Kyoto Protocol, and also on how to tackle the future, how to go from uh, the 19th of December uh, to, to the future. We have elements of that in place. Um, also, uh, the fact that all the major actors are here is very important. 
we have, of course, all the countries are represented, and they have uh, sent very large numbers of delegations, and we have 130 of the heads of states here. So all that is very good. But we also have a huge number of NGOs, civil society. Uh, the total number of people uh, were, it were expected for this conference were 15,000, and I believe we've surpassed the 45,000 registrations. Now, on the one hand, that is a fantastic development because the presence of the civil society, of the private sector, uh, is what we need, is what, is what creates the pressure for governments to, to do something. So th those huge numbers of, 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 of organizations from different backgrounds has been tremendously helpful to the process. At the same time, it has also created a problem because there are too many people and they can't fit in the conference center, as you know, and uh, the organizers had to, had to limit access because otherwise it simply would not have been possible, especially given the security requirements of the heads of states. But we have everybody here, and the decision-making power is in uh, the room. As the Secretary General said earlier, if, uh, if uh, these 130 leaders cannot take the decisions, who can? Um, now, in terms of uh, the, the, the commitments, uh, all the major players have made commitments uh, on mitigation, and while uh, uh, there's still room for Im higher level of ambition, for improvements, but the fact is that they have all made uh, tremendous progress. If you think back two years ago, uh, the, the very few countries had real serious midterm targets. Uh, then we had the, the EU, then we had Norway, then we had Japan, the, you know, the US. We have all the key major developing countries have some form of a, of a uh, substantial target that is on the table. And, and that is uh, that is quite a, a development. Um, now, we still have some way to go on the codification, on the, the, the way these are reported, but th there is extremely good discussions going on at the highest level between different countries on how one can find a compromise on that. Um, the, um, uh, and uh, we should also not forget that there behind the scenes where perhaps people don't talk about it that much, but there has been a fair amount of progress on some other issues which uh, maybe are not making the headlines every day, but for example, uh, red, the, the reduced emissions from deforestation. Uh, there's been good progress there, and uh, as long as there is an overall package, uh, there is very likely to be a, a significant agreement on red, uh, which is of course a very substantial part of global emissions. Same for technology, there's been some very good progress. So there are a couple of areas like that which, uh, which are there and where progress has been made uh, once we get the whole package together. So uh, basically, uh, uh, we, have a long, we have still a long way to go. These 24 hours will be long and very busy. Uh, uh, but uh, it is possible to seal the deal. We just have to make sure that uh, uh, all the leaders who are there are able to find a way uh, that their ideas can come together and can actually deliver the deal that we need. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Janos. And I'm going to uh, take the prerogative of uh, being the, the moderator and sponsor of Half Price Drinks. <laughs> To, uh, to ask the first question. I hope that's okay. Um, uh, Janos, you know, you've, I know it's impossible to say exactly where we'll end up um, at the end of the day, whether it, when it's, it's 5 a.m. Saturday morning or, or wherever it goes, maybe later than that even. But um, it's obvious that there's going to be a lot of work to do coming out of Copenhagen, um, you know, looking beyond into, into 2010 as we look to Mexico City for COP16. Um, you know, and, and, and I know that you're, everyone's focused really on what's ahead of us tomorrow, um, but could you maybe look ahead a little bit and, and talk a little bit about what the Secretary General might be thinking about, you know, as he looks to his 2010? Um, you know, there's the, the MDG uh, high-level event in September. Um, climate change obviously, you know, has some play there, um, so that's one area where we'll probably see some discussion on climate change. I'm sure the SG will keep uh, climate change is one of his top priorities throughout since he's made it sort of a signature issue. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about what, what you see, you know, maybe, maybe coming out of the Secretary General's office in, in 2010? Sure. Well, the, the first priority will be, of course, that we have to turn the, uh, the Converti agreement that we will have uh, by the end of uh, tomorrow, 
uh, some time uh, to a legally binding agreement. This is what everybody wants, and we want to do it quickly uh, in a, because it, it's, it's extraordinary times, and we need extraordinary effort to, to get that legally binding agreement done uh, as quickly as possible next year, whether it will take four months or six months or eight months doesn't matter, but it has to be done quickly. And the Secretary General will be very much focused on that. At the same time, uh, the agreement uh, that uh, is being constructed now should be effective already the 1st of January. It's, it's something that has an immediate operational significance. So uh, the, the second area where the Secretary General will be quite active is to work with the rest of the UN system uh, to, to ensure that the implementation of the agreement is done as well as possible, that countries are supported, that uh, the finances that will be made available begin to flow and begin to flow in a way uh, that the, uh, the countries can, can effectively do mitigation and adaptation activities as soon as possible. Uh, so those are the two more immediate ones. The third one will be, uh, uh, that's a, it's a very interesting, somewhat uh, perhaps different, but actually linked issue is that the Secretary General had already announced in September that he will set up a high-level panel on development and climate change. And uh, this is something that he intends to launch early next year. And uh, while this is not going to look at the immediate issues, it's more a strategic uh, uh, approach to looking at how the world community is facing climate change, how the institutions uh, that the world community has are able to, to actually deal with climate change and are able to incorporate climate change into the middle of the development process as opposed to having it on the outside as an externality. So that panel will start its work and hopefully will deliver its results in the one and a half years following it. So just in time for the uh, big uh, summit that will be planned in Rio de Janeiro in 2012, the 20th anniversary of the Rio Conference on Environment and Development. So that's a busy uh, couple of months ahead of us. Sounds like so. I think we'll uh, open it up to a few questions from uh, the floor here. Um, you know, we'll take probably, I'd say, maybe you have time for three to four questions because I'd really like to uh, uh, convince Janos to stick around and have one beer with us before he goes back to the bench. I'm getting, I'm getting ready for the beer, so <laughs> I, I just saw there on the bar, it really looks yeah. great. So, so um, I don't, okay, uh, Becca has the microphone, so there's one question right front and center there. Can't, the lights are in my eyes, so I can't really yeah. see who it is. But. For our guest, Janos, if you could um, give us your name and your affiliation, too. Uh, Jerry Culp, Huffington Post. Um, you'll forgive me if you're not the correct person to ask this question, but there's obviously been a, a lot of turmoil and uh, some emotional confrontations over the issue of access to COP15. And there were a large number of people with UN accreditation who were denied entry after having traveled, um, sorry, um, denied entry after traveling halfway around the planet to be here. And they were told by the UN that they would be granted access. And this happened on numerous occasions to a lot of people. And I was curious, um, is there any discussion on how to prevent this in the future? Uh, it's obviously uncomfortable for everyone. Well, uh, the, I can I can uh, respond to that, and in fact, uh, uh, less than an hour ago, I, I personally had a conversation with the Secretary General about this issue, and and he himself has been uh, briefed about this. He's he's very much concerned, and uh, he will certainly like to make sure that this does not happen again. Uh, if if limitations have to take place, then there are different ways of doing it now. Uh, what, what seems to have happened here is that the very huge numbers have, have really strained uh, the capacity of the, of, the, of the group, the system that was put in place to, to register. And I, I, I know a little bit about that system because some years back I was actually responsible for that at the UNFC Secretariat. But uh, the fact is that these numbers are absolutely huge and, and it just took everybody by surprise and the system simply couldn't handle it, the, the total system. So uh, we have learned a huge lesson there. It just shows that the tremendous uh, power and, and the energy that can be mobilized by the decisions that need to be made here. And, uh, um, you know, we, we just have to plan higher. That's all. <laughs> so we will do that. But I can tell you the Secretary General is quite concerned about this personally. Thank Thanks you. Great. Um, please step forward. Actually, if you'd like to ask a question, maybe you could line up here at the floor. We have time for, for about three more questions. So your name and affiliation, please. Hi, I'm Ben Jervie. I'm with a uh, Adopt a Negotiator uh, project, part of the Tick 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 campaign. Um, 
for two years now, the negotiators have been working for one year, working full time, um, negotiating sort of full full time on this project um, or on this on this treaty. Um, suddenly, with the 130 leaders, heads of state coming and uh, new treaties and the draft treaties that I saw this morning that I was looking through don't seem to resemble the work that's been done over the past two years to get here. Um, assuming some, assuming an agreement comes out of this tomorrow or Saturday, are, are, are we to see this as the result of the COP process of the UNFCCC process or is this a heads of state agreement coming together? Because what, what's on the table now, what, what we've seen today, does not resemble what's been negotiated for the past two years, and in particular the past three months. Well, uh, f first of all, there, there are lots of papers floating around, and uh, uh, the only things that we have seen formally are the, f the, the papers that are part of the formal negotiation process. There are other papers floating around. Indeed, everybody has papers. I have drafts in, you know, I've just written something. But, you know, it's, that's uh, governments, that's their job, is to come up with ideas. And, and, and so there are these papers floating around. But what is important is to, to recognize that the, the UNFCCC, uh, the parties, are the states, the state parties. And the highest representative of that state, are, they are here, the heads of state and government. And it is their job. To, to get the, the work done. And if, it's, uh, if it means uh, building on the process that has happened, then that's what you do. If it means uh, adjusting it, then that's what you do. If, you do. if it means doing something different, then that's what you have to do. But we have to get an agreement. And it is the state parties to the UNFCCC that have to do it. So this is the dynamics I was talking about earlier that is new. We never had this, this sort of a situation. We had many, many conferences of the parties where we had heads of states. We had one or two or maybe three. I think we, once we had five, but we never had 130. So it has become, uh, the, the, the issue has risen to the, to the level of the heads of states, and rightly so, because this is an issue that requires the heads of states and government. This is not about environment. This is not about transport. This is not about health. It's about the whole thing. It's about the whole economic development and how these issues relate, how they're linked. And really, that means the head of state has to be engaged. So they are now here, and we, we're inventing the process of how it's going to work. Thank you. Hello, Jonas. My name is Alex Kelly. I'm with Investigate West out of Seattle, Washington. Um, a moment ago, you cited the uh, red document being put forth as one of the potential victories coming out of the Copenhagen uh, Treaty. Um, maybe you're not the right person to ask uh, for the specifics on this, but I'm wondering if you can talk about the criticism that's been leveled recently about uh, the lack of a distinguishing definition between um, the intact rainforests and the monocultural plantations mm -hmm. that are being raised by many indigenous peoples mm -hmm. in the South? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm not an expert in this, but, but what I do know about this is that, uh, of course, we have to start, we have to look at the carbon value of the forest. That's why we're doing it in the context of the Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, at the same time, forests are about a lot of other things than just carbon. And we have to find a way that you can, you can count you can take into account the, the, the carbon value and at the same time ensure that all these other functions of the forest, whether they are ecological functions or social functions or employment-related issues, they, they are all taken into account. It's, a, it's, it's not easy, but I, I, I'm convinced that we will be able to do it. We just need to get this machinery going so that, so that we don't, don't miss it out, because if we wait too long, then they, the forest will not be there anymore. Hi, it's Brad Johnson with Think Progress. Uh, my uh, two hopefully brief questions. One, the first question is uh, about the civil society issues. Uh, in particular, uh, my understanding is that uh, civil society organizations play a, a particularly crucial role for small nations in uh, the least developed countries, who are also the nations that are have the most at stake here. And I was wondering if you could uh, discuss for people like me who have never been to one of these, uh, what the practical consequences of having them be locked out in these final days of negotiation has for these countries. Mm -hmm. And then the, the second briefer question is um, whether you think uh, Mr. Gore's proposal for moving the Mexico City uh, meeting from November, December up to July is something that is uh, feasible uh, just mm -hmm. on a practical sense. Yeah. 
Well, uh, first on the second question, uh, whether it's feasible or not, that's up to the Mexican government to say whether they have a conference facility at that time. Uh, they are certainly looking into this and, and uh, 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 from the political point of view, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's, that, would, that would be fine because that, that, the, the importance here is, again, it's not the six months or the seven or five. What is important is that we must do an extraordinary effort to get to this legally binding agreement. We can't just let this go that, okay, at the next COP, we'll deal with it next December. No. So we have to make the special effort. And, and by advancing the dates to some other date, that would be the demonstration of that. So definitely. Now, in terms of the, the civil society, uh, I, I do agree that civil society is very important for the small, more vulnerable states. But I think they're just as important for all states. Uh, I think that the role of the civil society in, in large countries like the United States is absolutely crucial. And without their work, we wouldn't be there where we are today. So uh, I, I think this is true for, for every country. Now, in terms of uh, the, 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 the process of a conference of the parties meeting, there are, there are many functions for, for civil society to, to play. And uh, one of them is, of course, to meet within themselves, to, to engage. And that's a very important function. You can do that anywhere. You can do it here. You're doing it. You can do it somewhere else. You can do it in a conference room in the center. Uh, another one is to, to, to bring your ideas and expose them to the, to the, to the parties, to the, to the government representatives. And I think you've been doing a lot of that during the first week and the first part of the second week. But then, of course, we had the limitation problem, and then that function dies out. The third one, and I think that's the trickiest one, is when you're working with the government representatives, either in some kind of advisory mode or, or, or just you want to get messages through. And, and that's, of course, the trickiest time is the, the, during the last days. And that's, that's true that that is becoming very difficult to do. So you just have to find some innovative ways of doing that through electronic means. But it's, it's a, it's a, it's a fact that it would be easier to do that if you're physically there in the corridors and you know you brush by and say oh well have you done this have you done that that's that's difficult now we will we'll, but I, I don't think there is an immediate solution to that other than what I said before thank you hi uh, Carl Burkhart with Discovery Network thanks for coming uh, Hillary Clinton uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton <coughs> laid some pretty major cards on the table today and I wondered if you could just comment on how they've impacted the negotiations today, um, the $100 billion figure, the contingency um, on China being transparent. And uh, I think I have our number here is, um, you know, something like 4% uh, if you factor in uh, over 1990 levels um, by 2020. So how does that play in with the whole dynamic? And was that a significant uh, move today? Well, we don't really know the impact of that until until later on tonight, uh, because the, the statement was made not so long ago. Uh, but uh, but it, they are quite sig significant, and and it, it demonstrates that the, that the U.S. is actually very serious about this matter. And uh, the number on on the uh, long-term financing is 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 really crucial, and that that is something that nobody expected. Uh, uh, from Washington, and now we have it. So uh, that that definitely has to have an impact on on the way the the balance uh, hangs. You know. So uh, my my guess is that definitely there will be an impact of, of that, uh, and now we'll have to see what what reactions th there will be uh, in the, in the in the both in the formal negotiation process and the corridor discussion. So let's see later tonight or by breakfast tomorrow. We'll know. <laughs> Thanks. And one final question for Janos. Thank you for taking the time to come over here. Um, what was the reasoning behind, oh, Kevin Grandia, right on a whole bunch of different websites and that kind of thing. Um, so the children, or the, the kids yesterday, last night, sitting in the corridors, way away from anything happening, I mean, that place is huge. What was the reasoning for such an ultimatum to have the kids leave um, when they were just sitting there reading out names really weren't doing anything. I mean, the media wouldn't be bothered by it. I'm sure I've seen similar things where people are doing actions mm -hmm. quietly off to the side. For instance, in Barcelona, where the delegates were walking into the room and there was the clocks and everybody chanting and all that, that was fine. Mm -hmm. And that was right at the delegation room. This was way away. Mm -hmm. They were just sitting there. I mean, put a security guard there if you're worried about mm -hmm. you know national security issues. I, I don't know. What was the reasoning for the uh, that ultimatum that that was was pretty harsh to say all civil society would be out of the center if these kids 
didn't leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, to be honest, I don't know the details of this particular case, so I, I can't answer it. But, but what I do know is that, that, that there were some real serious security issues uh, arising in terms of the visit of the heads of states and government. And this is, this, is, this is a very serious matter. Normally, heads of states and government, when they gather in a place like that, there are, there, there are all kinds of other things happening that, that, that cannot happen in this normal conference setup. And so the, 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 the local security are, are, are suggesting pretty extraordinary measures. I mean, I know what it takes in the, the UN building in New York, which is actually pretty well set up for high security meetings. But outside on the East River, you have, you have uh, half the US Navy circulating at that time. So you know, they're, they're trying to deal with this the best way they can. And, um, and maybe some, some things were not done the right way. I, I'm not saying everything is perfect. But I think everybody is trying to deal with this extraordinary situation in the best way we can. There was confirmed security risk? Yes. There was? No, not with them, those kids. I don't know that. No, but there is generally confirmed security problems. Yes. Okay. Um, I just want to thank you, Janas, for taking time out of your obviously extremely busy schedule to join us and um, encourage people also to check out the UN Seal the Deal website. The UN has really um, uh, played a, a big role in, in driving the seal to the deal petition to get millions of people around the world um, and civil society to engage in this process as well. So they've really been an ally in, um, uh, in getting the, the best deal possible this week. And, you know, Tick, Tick, Tick is happy to, to have you here tonight to speak to our bloggers. Um, I think we're all sort of in the same boat that we'd like to address the issue of climate change. Um, as quickly and as uh, meaningfully as possible. So thank you. Th thank you very much. And, and don't forget, even if we get the, the tomorrow, the deal will be really successful. This goes on, and we need your support next year and the year after. This is a long-term process, and we need it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I would like to say one uh, final word. This is, my, this is my last night in Copenhagen. Unfortunately, I, I won't be here for the final night here.